Welcome to Season 3 of Girl Sense. I'm Maria del Calmen, your host. Today's special guest is Rosemary Tracy Woods. Rosemary was enriched in the world of arts in all its capacity at a very young age. She has crossed paths with legends such as Sammy Davis Jr., which she'll explain shortly. Today, she's the executive director and chief curator of Art for the Soul Gallery in Springfield, Massachusetts. Rosemary, I'm so honored to have you on my platform. Welcome to the Girl Sense family. And I am so honored to be on your platform. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Rosemary, you grew up in South Philadelphia. Was South Philadelphia an in, was it influential for the world of arts? I don't think so. Oh. And everyone calls me Tracy. Oh, Tracy, okay. Tr everyone calls me Tracy. You know how you get those nicknames? Sure. And growing up in a family with all boys, they would say T and yeah. a later stretched out to Tracy. Great. Um, South Philadelphia, was it influential? I really don't know. Okay. It was so diverse. Mm. It was a neighborhood of everything and everyone. So since we had a high population of Italians, I would say maybe so because you could always hear someone singing or mm. someone playing an instrument. Sure. And uh, also because of the black population, there was always music, always music. Oh, God. And speaking of um, or honing into family, was there anyone in your family in particular, outside from yourself, that was also interested in the arts and in what form? Well, I had an aunt that collected collected antiques. Okay. I had a, a cousin who, believe it or not, was a grave digger. Oh. And he later went on to become a, a famous photographer. Well, I wouldn't say famous, but he had a collection well when he, well-known photographer, that he had a collection of tombstones, grave headings, gravestones um, that far exceeded anything else. And then, of course, there was my uncle and my brother and others. And I think everyone in the family did a little bit of everything as far as the arts. As far as the arts. And I'm going to ask a little bit more about your brother because I think it's fascinating as well um, because you were able to travel with him. So tell me a little bit more about that and, and your journey with whom you were able to meet along that journey. Um, well, my brother was Harold, the late Harold Melvin. In fact, he's been dead 21 years. Okay. And I did travel with my brother. And that's what gave me my first experience of museums and galleries. And what was his specialty? What was his craft? He, he, he was a singer. singer. Okay. R&B, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, uh, <laughs> legend Philadelphia. He and his, um, well, our high school friend or a neighborhood friend, Kenny Gamble, Gamble and Huff, they um, in, intertwined and started um, the publishing company yeah. and doing the recording of some of the famous hits. Kenny uh, Gamble and Huff were extensive writers mm -hmm. and Harold wrote uh, as well. Wonderful. But as far as traveling, I met so many people, but I met Lola Felina, who's also from Philadelphia, she was my dance teacher. Oh my goodness. So I wasn't too great of a dancer. <laughs> but Lola did, and she got a star and role in Golden Boy with Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in that, I didn't do too much of anything. I was more of a uh, study in or walk across sure. the stage. Sure, or, sure skip across the stage in Golden Boy with but Sammy Davis. But you were Davis. there. Uh, but you were there. You were in the same room with Sammy. But, but you know, uh, people don't realize in Philadelphia, you could go to the Academy of Music. You could go to any of the places like that, and you could make money. Mm. You could make money. By, I would go backstage of the Uptown and uh, or at Pep's Show Bar, and you would meet the entertainers and they would send you to the store or you go pick up the laundry. Oh my goodness. It was always something. I remember when I first went to New York and was staying there, hmm. there were um, Dave Baldwin, it was uh, Ron O'Neill, Nikki Giovanni, everyone, it was 
90th and Central Park West. Mm. It was Mikkel's Bar. It was uh, Winnie Winfrey who used who wind up marrying. Uh, I think he married Beverly Johnson, who okay. was the top model sure, at that time. Yeah. So it was just people that you knew from the neighborhood. Wow, that's so ex impressive. I would well, to I say the least. That. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, um, what is your most impactful moment um, during your childhood in South Philly uh, that enhanced your lifelong profession in the arts? Like, what what was that moment in time that, like, okay, this is what I know that I like, and this is why, and this is what I'm going to take with me, and what still stands out? Well, I think that was my one of many trips to the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art. Okay. I used to hide in the Philadelphia Museum of Art so I wouldn't have to do chores. Okay. I had an aunt who worked for a, she was a housekeeper uh -huh. for a prominent white family in mm -hmm. Philadelphia. So I would have to go there after school and wait for her. And I wasn't going to do chores. I wasn't <laughs> polishing silver. I wasn't doing any of those things. So I would run across to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and hide. Okay. And uh, one day sitting back there, I ran into uh, Henry Tanner's niece. She was an attorney. Okay. And she was bringing into the museum some of the Tanner's works. Okay. Now, I don't know if you have ever seen the banjo lesson by Henry Tanner, but he was a very, very renowned artist from Philadelphia who had to, like many other artists, go to Paris to be recognized. Right. And in that, I got an opportunity to see this piece of work. Mm. And in all the places I had been, not in school, and mm. I went to parochial school, mm -hmm. uh, not in any of my travels, not at any of the hotels that I stayed, or any places that I had been, mm -hmm. had I ever seen black art. When I say black art, art that resembled me right. and if you look at the banjo lesson it is so striking okay. and it's my most favorite piece and at that moment I knew oh I've got to, there must be other pieces of work like sure. this so I would go to different cities mm -hmm. and while the group slept all night I mean all day because they worked all night yeah I would venture out and go to museums and galleries and look for those Disappointingly, I didn't find too much of black art mm -hmm. in public places. Okay, oh my goodness. All right, so as mentioned before, art has allowed you to travel the world. Um, uh, what form of art interested you the most within your travels? I think um, art that's been done by people of color Yes. I've been to Paris, to the Louvre, I've been to London, I've been to uh, Amsterdam, various places, and then all throughout the United States. Mm. But I think the art that grabs me the most are, is the art that's in countries that are predominantly a people of color. Okay. When I went to Cuba, I was ready to move. Yeah. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I mean, the art is so touching is mm -hmm. so uh, you can relate to it it sure. grabs you yeah. and I know that artists of color like white artists paint what we see paint what we mm -hmm. feel mm -hmm. and we have such a rich history mm -hmm. and our day-to-day -day life is so exciting and interesting that that's what draws me I mean I see the abstract when I went to the Louvre I was glad to see Monet and Picasso and all the big names sure. because I hadn't seen their pieces in museums maybe but not compiled in one place right but when I went to Cuba no matter what it was I was so excited mm. it was just so awesome the creativity I went in a plaza just a park and I saw this beautiful piece of uh, installation and I thought I said my goodness what is, what is this beautiful chandelier doing in the middle of a park yeah. and as I approached it it brought tears to my eyes because it had been compiled of old wine bottles oh. soda bottles things that we just throw away sure. 
and it was the most beautiful piece of sculpture mm -hmm. that I had ever mm -hmm. seen. And things like that, that's what I like, something different. Right, right. Um, so sometimes we travel to learn more about our passion, um, but what has art taught you? Um, how has art taught you after your travels? So what did the art speak to you? What did it show, uh, teach you rather than the, uh, the reverse? You're going now to learn more about the arts, but how did it speak to you? Um, it makes, it humbles you. Mm. It makes you realize that the, God has created these human beings mm. who can create such wonderful things and it doesn't depend on the mental uh, IQ yeah. or where they grew up mm -hmm. or the uh, institutions that they went to or attended, mm -hmm. that is a gift. It's a gift from God. Mm -hmm. So each time that I travel, when I come back, I think I'm more humble, more appreciative of things that we take for granted. Absolutely, yeah. And that sculpture of the bottle speaks. The sculpture of the bottle. Just, all you have to see is just stand there and, and it'll tell you the story, right? It'll speak absolutely. to you right These then and people, there. Like how many times have I thrown a bottle in the garbage? Uh, <laughs> and, and in so, Cuba, they don't throw anything, anything away. away. Yeah. I mean, they take advantage of everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, really getting into more um, ecology art, mm -hmm. or art that's uh, recyclable, organic, mm -hmm. organic things mm -hmm. that people are making, mm -hmm. or creating art from trash, sure. rubbish. Yeah. And I think the children need to learn that that everything is valuable. Mm -hmm. There's no tr such thing as trash. Right. You know, but they yeah. say another man's treasure, uh, trash, trash is someone else's treasure. treasure. Yeah. And that's what we have to learn. Well, good lead into my next um, segment here. So I first met you about two years ago, and it happened to be at an event for Black History Month for a, a, a university. Um, and you donated your time, of course, and you showcased more of your of the artwork that you um, were uh, presenting that day. Um, how important is it for you to introduce the world of art to the community? Like, how important is that to you? Well, I'm not an artist myself. Correct. I can't yeah. draw a straight line <laughs> with a ruler. But I appreciate artists. And sure. Yeah. Of I've worked with artists with disabilities. Mm. I worked with an uh, artist who had uh, MS from birth. Mm. And at the time I met him, he was 75 years old. And he drew with his left foot. Oh my goodness. And his work looked like Monet. Oh. And it would take him one hour to just sign his work. Oh my God. Just just what, one hour just to sign each piece. Mm -hmm. So when I go, I, I think the world needs to know about this genius, mm -hmm. this man who's been dealt such a blow, mm -hmm. you would say, with the disability. And it's not really a disability right. because he has other gifts that God has mm -hmm. given him. I, I just want people to see, I mean, there's so many talented artists mm -hmm. and I focus on artists of color because that's what I'm surrounded by. Sure. I don't really get the opportunity to meet, you know, white established artists. They're mm -hmm. not gonna talk to me. I mean they may, but they're in another realm. Uh, like everything else, art has the racial mm -hmm. tone to it. Okay. Um there are many things that are uh, being taken away um, in the education and school system. Um, how important is it specifically to engage children in the world of art? Well, I started out advocating through the Massachusetts Culture Council for arts and education. Mm. And when I say art, I mean visual art. Sure. I mean performing arts. I remember growing up and there was a band, there was a glee mm -hmm. club, there was a theater club. Every child could, a uh, marching band could belong to something. Yes. You didn't, you, everyone identified with something. It was after school program, mm -hmm. during school program, chorus, everything. Mm -hmm. They t that is the first thing that goes. And I advocate all over the state for arts in the schools, arts and education. I try to inform the schools in my hometown of Springfield mm -hmm. about the 
artist in residency program that comes through the state Massachusetts Cultural Council that you don't always have to have a teacher on staff, but you can apply for a small grant that will allow an artist to come into the school mm -hmm. and teach art or dance or whatever mm -hmm. uh, for a short time and that gives them something. I think parents need to advocate for that. Mm -hmm. I think parents need to just rally. Mm -hmm. Art is so important, It is so important. It is, thank you for that. So um, now this brings me to your current role today, <laughs> and I'll reiterate your role today um, is the executive director and chief curator of Art for the Soul Gallery, again in Springfield, Mass. Um, is this your first gallery? Um, how did this particular gallery um, become realization? Well, when you say that, all those titles, that means you are the dishwasher, you are the caterer, you are the installer, you are all of that. It's, right. a, it's just a title, uh, a nice way of saying, get the job done. Right. I really started out with a friend here in, in uh, Connecticut, okay. Stella Butler. She and I decided, because she was at the time doing home parties okay. for a uh, uh, um, a company that sold art okay. prints. I think it was um, personal preference. It okay. was like uh, Mary Kay. Sure, you went out sure, and did yeah, things. Yeah. And I said, we can do this. I know artists. Let's start our own business. Yeah. So we did. We started out of her garage in Bloomfield. Mm. And then we ventured to Main Street. And then I had a piece of property in Springfield. I was working for the state of Connecticut at the time. Okay. And I, it was just, I said, why not take this small uh, property I have where mm -hmm. my condo is located and mm -hmm. we turned into a gallery. So she stayed here yeah. and I opened the gallery in 1999 and I asked a friend, now what are we going to call this? <laughs> and I called all my friends and I had one friend, uh, Jay Oliver, who at the time was living in the condo that I owned, said, ah, what about art for the soul? And it that clicked. And at that time, mm -hmm. There was no art for the soul. We went on the um, computer, a search, yeah. a search, and there wasn't. But I could not afford it that time. I should have trademarked sure. it. Now, if you go on, there's so many art for the soul, mm, art for the yeah, soul, yeah, and yeah. it has caught. But so since 1999 until uh, maybe under the Deval Patrick, who was our governor in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and they were doing this creative economy. Mm -hmm. And I got pulled into starting a co-op gallery. There were a number of artists who okay. were going to maintain a gallery mm -hmm. and just run it, and I would oversee it. Well, after three years, I wind up being the one who was there every, every day, day because artists don't want a gallery mm -hmm. sit. They usually work full time. Sure. And so out of that Artist Square group gallery came Art, Art for, for the, the Soul, Soul. gallery. Okay. And um, Tracy, <laughs> or Rosemary, or Rosemary. Uh, you um, had an impactful grand opening um, that I learned about, uh, to say the least. It was daring, yet um, it was innovative, and I'm sure you've captured everyone's attention. Um, so if you can tell me about that launch, um, based on uh, that subject matter. Okay, are you talking about 10 little yes. girls? Yes. So after um, we had Artist Square Group Gallery for about three years and the model was great, but it just wasn't working because again, uh, the, the line, the bottom line is the bottom line mm -hmm. and we were losing money. Yeah. So. We decided to shut down. We were a for-profit, and Western New England invited me to apply for nonprofit status just based on what I did in the community. Hmm. I think that was a big mistake. But um, so we shut down, and we changed our model, and we decided that we would just do solo exhibits just with one artist or maybe two artists. Hmm. And at the time, uh, Dr. Ima Nis Ime, who is a professor at um, Westfield State, 
Harvard, uh, Yale graduate, oh my goodness, I said Harvard, Yale graduate mm -hmm. had, was doing a new series of work. And as always, we tried to have our exhibitions be something that will be conversation, a conversation piece, sure. educational piece, and a dialogue, mm -hmm. just not just an exhibition. Right. Cause, and we also want to teach the public about the various types of art, collecting art. Mm -hmm. So this, at the beginning, we had quite a few sponsors. This was a research project for him. He had researched. There was a, tons of murders of um, black boys as well as there was a surge or a deep awareness mm -hmm. of sex trafficking of girls, mm -hmm. particularly black girls. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do this exhibit. The name of the, ex the exhibit, which was not our name per se, but one that Dr. Uh, Ima had researched on, and it was called 10 Little Blank girls mm -hmm. with the N word, yes. and at that time the N word, and should we use it? Should we not? Right. So can I say it? Um, N word. <laughs> the N word. Mm -hmm. um, and it was crossed out, yeah, uh, like it should be. And it was based on a novel by an author, uh, English author, which taught um, white children how to count, but through the demise of black children. And then you remember there were 10 little Indians mm -hmm. and then there were um, something else, but it sure. was just horrible. So he had these 10 beautiful pieces he mm -hmm. works on with charcoal and Indian ink. Okay. And he had created 10 girls okay. and each of them had a meaning and some relevance as to what was going on. We had selfie girl taking the selfies. Um, yeah. uh, one girl, depression. It was just an awesome exhibit. Okay. One of the most popular exhibits as far as people coming into the gallery. Yes. But in the beginning, I was so glad that one, we have a fence, a gate, and two, the backlash that I received. Um, People would say, how dare you use that word? And it wasn't my word. Right. It wasn't my title. It was right. actually the title of a book. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, people have been using it. It was such a debate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when we did the show, um, people came, but they came out of curiosity. curiosity. They came to criticize. Mm. And as I said, when we first started off, we had a sponsorship about twenty thousand mm -hmm. uh, dollars. But because we would not change the title of the show mm -hmm. on opening day, we were down to a sponsorship of maybe five hundred. Okay. And that was basically my social security check. <laughs> <laughs> but Aww. yeah, but Aww. it was awesome. So, do you think that they knew the history? Um, you think they just went purely out of curiosity? Like they really had zero knowledge of the exhibit, of the meaning of the book, you know? Um, and when they arrived there, do you think did they get it then, or did you do, or did they get it after they criticized days later? Well, they got it if they came because we also had Bill Costin, who has one of the largest mm -hmm. memorabilia collections. We had all the memorabilia in the wall. We had the book, who, by the way, um, had uh, Kanye West, West had mm -hmm. bought the rights to this book. He had the only print okay. left of that because you can't, can't find it anywhere. Okay. Um, but you can look online and see it. Mm. Ten little blank yeah. girls, yeah. ten little blank boys. Um, and then we told the story and we had a slideshow going all the time. Mm. So yeah. it was educational. And believe it or not, we had uh, undoing racism mm. come in 
to have some dialogue. We had tons of colleges and universities come in. That's amazing. And taught them. And even phrases that we use like blackmail. Do you know how that term came about? No. Uh, because the slave masters used to have the little bo black boy mm. run down to the end of this long driveway when the mailman came, they would ring a bell, and he had to get down there, get the mail, and get back. And it was a game. And if he was late or anything, they would beat him. Mm. And that how blackmail, the terminology sure. came. Just a lot of terms we use. Right, yeah, uh, data we bait. How they used to feed uh, black children, use them as alligator bait That's in Florida. Mm. And uh, it, it was just horrible, yeah, some of the terminology. But the book was very exciting. Now I have to go out and get you the book. I, ha I, mean, you can't, I can't get you it. You can't get the I book. I can read anything you more can read about it, learn more myself. About it. Yeah. By Nora Case. So, who are your favorite artists? Uh, all of them. All of I them. have so <laughs> many. I have so many. Henry Tanner definitely is one of my favorite. But, um, and all the old masters, mm. um, the Beardens, uh, um, Charles White. Uh, there, there's so many. A lot of the, uh, I deal with a lot of the contemporary artists mm -hmm. of today. Mm -hmm. And um, I hate to say they'll be upset, but I have quite a few. And most of them have been to the gallery to exhibit. Oh, good, yeah. Um, and whose artwork would you love to display at Art of Soul? Um, it's probably some of the old masters okay. that are in collectors. Yeah. Um, or uh, a lot of them are at the historic mm -hmm. black colleges. A lot of the artwork, are like uh, some of the collection of Bill Cosby, uh, Maya Angelou, mm. and those people have collected over the years. Sure. If I would take a few pieces mm -hmm. from each of them, mm -hmm. but the insurance, mm -hmm. uh, the terms, and being okay. able to get that work here. Awesome, that's um, so great. Um, I'm gonna read your mission. Okay. And then I'll just ask one question afterwards. Um, so your mission is as follows. Art for the Soul Gallery strives to promote understanding and inspire an appreciation of the achievements, contributions, and experiences of diverse artists as they exist throughout the world through exhibits, programs, and activities that illustrate historical, political, and social passage through present day. Let's say I know nothing about art and I happen to stroll inside the art of gallery and you're sitting there and you watch me walk in. What would you want me, what would you want my experience to be? Um, I would want your experience to be that here you have an exhibition and I would tell you who the artists were, maybe a little history of them. There's no right or wrong way in observing mm -hmm. art or appreciating art. It's Art speaks to everyone in mm -hmm. a different manner. Mm -hmm. And that, I hope it's not your last time. Mm -hmm. And before you go out and buy a piece of art, know that there's value mm -hmm. in art. A lot of people say, oh, I can get that. Uh, the um, One is the funeral procession, the one that everyone sees on Bill Cosby mm -hmm. with the marching mm -hmm. up the hill in the coffin. You can, you can go out and buy a print. But you cannot buy the original mm -hmm. because someone owns that. So when you take that print off your wall a year from now, five years from now, it's still going to be a print. Yeah. But if you invest in an original piece of art, when you take it off your wall, nine times out of ten, particularly if the artist has died, that piece of work has yeah. increased in value. And that don't just spend your money. I mean, sure, buy decorative pieces sure. of work, but if you can, buy something of value. Wonderful. And I know that there are some upcoming events that the Art of Soul is hosting or is part of. Um, what's the most uh, one coming up? Well, as, uh, as, as um, 
Tomorrow, we have oh. Dinga McCannon, who's one of the most famous fi uh, fiber artists in the world. She's in the exhibition, We Want a Revolution, okay. which is started off at the Brooklyn Museum. She'll be doing an artist talk at the gallery from six to eight. Uh, we'll be uh, Gloria Arce. Dr. Arce has an exhibit at the smaller gallery at, located in the classical condos, and her work will be there until mid-November. And then uh, we'll be bringing in Dane Tillman, and we'll be doing our Christmas show. Sure. And most of all, we're going to be doing October 13th, a tribute to Harold Melvin mm. to keep his legacy going, Excellent. and it's the Harold Melvin's Blue Notes, and that's our fundraiser, mm -hmm. and portion of those proceeds will go to the Springfield Boys and Girls Club Family Center, mm -hmm. and also just to keep the legacy alive and to help of the gallery. Course, we yes. don't really, really get funding. Mm -hmm. um, everyone says write grants. Well, folks, when you write grants, you really, really have to not only have a great grant writer, you have to know someone who's given that money away. Yeah. It's all political. It's <laughs> correct. Um, Rosemary, it has been a pleasure to add you to the Girl Sense family. And I have strolled into the Art of Gallery <laughs> before, and I will be returning oh, again. thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, it was such a pleasure having you. I. I I cheat because I, um, uh, on my way to my garage after work, I get to peek in all the time. But definitely, you know, spending this um, quality time with you today um, has been very meaningful to me. Oh, thank you so, so thank much. You. I appreciate it. I <laughs> so appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Maria del Carmen, your host. Visit GirlSense.com for more information about our guests. Join us again for more GirlSense.